Good morning from Toronto, Ontario. I join you from Eastern Time. So good afternoon to those of you joining from across Turtle Island, including those who are well into your afternoon. I hope that all of you are doing well, knowing that we've all had challenging days behind us, but hopefully not too many more days of the pandemic in front of us. I am Dr. Denise O'Neill Green, Vice President, Equity and Community Inclusion, and Associate Professor in the School of Child and Youth Care in the Faculty of Community Services at Ryerson University. Welcome to this panel discussion as part of the National Forum on Anti-Asian Racism, Building Solidarities. But before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge the land. Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. The Dish, or sometimes it's called the Bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario, from the Great Lakes to Quebec, from Lake Simcoe into the United States. We all eat out of the dish, all of us that share this territory with only one spoon. There are no knives or forks at the table, representing that we must keep the peace. But more importantly, it means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share with it. And I'm very grateful to share this virtual space with all of you today. I'm honored to welcome you to today's panel discussion in conversation with equity and community inclusion leaders on the issues of racism. Before we begin, let me introduce our three esteemed panelists who are joining from Ontario and Manitoba. I'm only going to highlight a few notable points about each panelist and would encourage you to visit the National Forum's website for their full bios. First, there is Dr. Ari Alsheba, Associate Vice President, Equity, and inclusion and adjunct associate professor in the Department of Sociology at McMaster University. Arik is McMaster's inaugural associate vice president, equity and inclusion. In addition to overseeing the equity and inclusion office, she is currently responsible for championing inclusive excellence in leading the development and implementation of institution-wide strategic equity, diversity, and inclusion priorities. Second, we have Stephanie Simpson, Associate Vice Principal, Human Rights, Equity, and Inclusion from Queen's University. Stephanie leads the Human Rights and Equity Office and plays a key role in fostering both competence and legislative compliance around matters such as inclusivity, diversity, accessibility, human rights, sexual violence prevention, and equity on Queens campus. Stephanie holds a master's of education degree and a master's of laws degree from Queens, and she has been a well-respected leader on equity, diversity, and inclusion for many years. And thirdly, we have Valerie Williams, equity, diversity, and inclusion facilitator at the University of Manitoba. In her role as Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Facilitator in Human Resources, University of Manitoba, Valerie Williams supports organizational development through promoting proactive human resources, equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy grounded in social justice. Valerie's portfolio includes raising awareness to faculty and staff through the facilitation of workshops, researching best practices, and supporting equity committees, faculties, units, and departments. So we welcome all three of our panelists today. 
So let's just jump right in and, and get started. Almost 10 years ago, when I moved from the United States to Canada, a few people told me that racism doesn't exist in Canada. <laughs> Just, just so you know. <laughs> However, we all know it's quite the contrary. There's racism in many different forms, including, including anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, and anti-Asian racism. And ironically, the primary reason why our roles even exist is because there have been incidents of racism and policies and practices that perpetuate systemic racism. As such, universities and colleges have created new equity and inclusion offices in positions like ours to serve broad university communities and bring about change. So within that context, as well as others, um, our, our, my first question to all three of you is in what ways do equity and inclusion, as we call it here, ECI, leaders serve the university community? And that community being students, faculty, staff, and more broadly. What are the opportunities and limitations of the ability to bring about change. So let's start with you, uh, Arik. Thanks so much, Denise. And it's also a pleasure to be here with Valerie and Stephanie. Um, I'm, I'm joining you as well from Dish with One Spoon territory. Um, uh, so let me just uh, start things off um, uh, by saying that, uh, thanks for mentioning that, uh, you know, uh, Ten years ago, that's probably about the time when um, the, we were starting to see uh, the, the rise of the um, cabinet level, if you want to call it that, diversity officer. Um, and I, I, I do want to say that uh, as a best practice, we need to have these kinds of dedicated resources, but also combined with um, the distributed EDI leadership. So, so I do think that um, our roles you know, in what ways do we serve the university? Really, I, I think in fundamental ways, uh, as institutions are starting to think about and appreciate um, how EDI is actually mission critical, right? Critical to the academic mission, critical to um, excellence and starting to adopt the language of inclusive excellence, our, our roles, along with other EDI champions distributed across the institution, are, are, are really important. And so a few, a few ways that, in, in my role, I think about serving students, faculty, and staff. Um, we drive and, and we're champions for pan-institutional strategic priorities. Um, we have a proactive and a responsive mandate that it's really quite important. Um, obviously, leading development implementation of proactive, responsive uh, policies, programs, and services, uh, but also uh, a, a really important support and advisory function, um, not just for the campus community at large, but perhaps most importantly to the to the senior most leadership. And because this is a, a forum, an anti-racism forum, I, I have to say that we have to um, uh, nuance how we service our communities uh, to appreciate the different needs of our racialized students, faculty, and, and staff, and, and non-racialized um, students, faculty, and, and staff. And, and one of the most important roles we can play because we know that we've got a, a long way to go in terms of, of diversifying, particularly around um, uh, the, the racial composition of leadership, is the role that we play in courageously um, elevating amplifying the voices of uh, and, the, and the issues for uh, racialized communities. So that's how I'll, I'll start things off. Mm -hmm. Yes, the idea of amplifying those racialized voices, uh, that's a very important role and function that we have, um, especially in institutions that traditionally operate in such a silo manner and hasn't 
uh, historically been inclusive of those racialized voices in, in spite of all the diversity that's there and the promise of diversity that we say we're about. Uh, Stephanie or Valerie, what, what are your thoughts about this question? It's great to join you from Treaty One. Thank you so much. In my role, I do promote EDI best practices and support the faculties, units, and departments in creating their equity plans. And it's interesting because I do, I'm one person in human resources for the entire university. We are in the midst of hiring an EDI lead to report to the president, but that's been a long time coming. So really, EDI is under-resourced with a huge portfolio that's unrealistic. And one of the most useful tools I find is sharing solid data with senior administration. You can't ignore numbers. So I run a workforce analysis report that shows our representation compared to external labor market availability. And we have significant underrepresentation for indigenous peoples racialized persons, persons with a disability, and women in senior roles. And based on that, those numbers, I create my EDI strategy. Those initiatives needed to close the gaps in underrepresentation. So that is a, one of the things that I do. I also deliver, you know, um, workshops dismantling racism in the workplace to faculty and staff and students. Students are not part of my portfolio, and we do not collect student data. We do not collect student demographics, which is a flaw which I've been promoting for several years now. So, and with the lack of an EDI person responsible for students, they fall in into, in, under my umbrella, which I'm glad for. However, so much more needs to be done, so thank you. Oh my goodness, Valerie, there's so much I could say about that. <laughs> you're talking about data, you're talking about you're the only one person for the entire institution? Yes. To bring about this kind of change? Unrealistic. We don't do that for other priorities. No. Why do we do that for mm -hmm. these particular priorities? Well, but before I kick it to Stephanie, I just want to say when I started at Ryerson, um, I had such a, <clears throat> excuse me, I had such a tough time with um, getting my colleagues to understand that data is very important when it comes to this work, that it has to be informed by evidence. And there seems to be this assumption that <clears throat> excuse me, that this type of work um, is fluffy. <laughs> Maybe I'll describe it like that. Although I do like fluffy things, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. There is so much to pick up on here. There is so much to pick up on. I barely know where to start with it. So uh, just a couple of of threads. So yeah, the work absolutely, as you were saying, Valerie, is under-resourced and under-supported. And it's, I, I think that over the past 10 years, as you were suggesting, Arid, there has been um, a pivot. There's been a shift in the landscape such that, you know, these roles are being given more prominence and, you know, we're seeing more respect for them within the institution, but still, there are lots of folks um, out there in roles like ours or adjacent to ours that, um, you know, are really challenged. Um, I remember going to a conference meeting, uh, I guess a couple of years ago and being approached by colleagues at, a, at another institution. And they said to me, you know, I'd really like to spend a few minutes with you um, figuring out how Queens does it. And I wanted to smile in the first instance, we're being recorded here. Smile in the first instance to say, well, I mean, I don't know that Queens, you know, like that, that we lead the sector exactly, but we have done some things here. Um, but really your issue is resources. 
I have a staff. I'm fortunate and privileged enough at this institution to have 13 people working with me. That's not, and that's not enough. Because if, as Arik was saying, we're serious about making EDI mission critical for this institution and actually embedding it and threading it throughout the institution in a way that's meaningful for everyone, then that's not enough. When you break that down, that's me having a couple of advisors for human rights, one advisors for access accessibility, one advisor for the FCP. So you can see how we begin to get stretched. So I think I, I imagine that that's going to be a thread um, throughout this <laughs> throughout this conversation. Certainly, as I was thinking about uh, the the uh, forum questions today, that one kept coming to mind. And then I, I wanted to pick up on what you were saying to Arig about the courageous um, conversations that we need to have within our institutions and that in our roles we are trying and that we are determined to have within our institutions. Um, and just to say that that's, that's not easy. Um, and we have colleagues across the sector, wonderful colleagues, um, who are not racialized and who are doing uh, amazing work where, wherever they are. I will say that there is, um, you know, a, you know, particular uh, troubling that is attached to those of us who are racialized in these spaces and considering how few people there are still in senior leadership positions in our institution who are racialized. So. Um, I, I, I really like um, Sarah Ahmed's work on, on being included and this whole idea of being space invaders. I really do feel like that sometimes and the idea that, you know, we're here to, what's our role? You know, we, we trouble conversations and we, you know, um, create ripples and we fight for opportunities to have a different kind of discourse. Um, on the campus. And one last thing that I want to say is that we also stop things from happening. We, mm -hmm. we are a place of opening for conversations that people are not always willing to have or don't know how to have. Um, but um, I was just reflecting on this recently because I was having a conversation, trying to make a, 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 a short story long here, having a conversation with a counterpart on campus. Um, and they told me that somebody had said, this is somebody who had wanted an initiative to take place, which I felt was ill-advised for a number of reasons. Um, it was performative. It was rooted in action bias. Like, you know, we're just going to take the box. And the person um, had, had told their department, um, well, this isn't going forward. And if you want it to go forward, you need to talk to Stephanie Simpson. She's the barrier. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Um, but there are different ways in which, you know, we are, you know, perceived and we are conceived and, and you're right, you know, where, I see that, you know, something has the potential to actually create harm for equity deserving communities because it's performative and because people haven't actually done that work and they haven't found the data and they haven't thought about how they're actually going to support people, then yes, I'm going to challenge that. So we're both an opening and a challenge, which, I, you know, it's interesting to reflect on that. I, I love that um, that idea and and concept that we're there to um, ultimately disrupt <clears throat> disrupt the status quo. Sometimes I call it disrupt the status quota. The quota <laughs> is typically leaving out racialized people, whether it be Asian, Indigenous, Black, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but it, it is to disrupt and call people in and to keep certain things from happening to, to keep and reduce the harm mm -hmm. that 
so often is um, unfortunately a part of this landscape and in this work. And, um, you know, just going back to the idea of resources and data and, and data on whom, whether it be students or staff or faculty is extremely important. So in, in thinking about all of that as um, uh, a context in, in how we operate, then what role can the community play uh, in supporting us as leaders? I know that uh, it's definitely our role to support the community and to support a diversity of communities which have very different needs and expectations. So what, uh, in, in your estimation, uh, I, and I'll, I'll start with you, Stephanie, um, uh, what role does or can the community play in supporting the work of EDI leaders in addressing issues of, of racism, hate, and, and discrimination, especially if we're perceived as barriers? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all I can say, I, I mean, from my particular vantage point, uh, is that we we desperately need um, community behind us in terms of the work that we do, and in our our office, we're you know forever talking about what distinguishes our office and our work from many other forms of work um, within the university community and that is our deep connection to the communities that we that we serve um, you know if we if we're we're not fostering and nurturing those connections in our office then we're doing something really fundamentally wrong um, and i think a lot of folks within the community um, conceive of of power and of you know influence as a very top-down thing you know um that's another interesting lesson that i'm continually learning within this role within the institution is how fluid power actually is and nobody ever thinks that they have any <laughs> but that's definitely the case for a lot of community members who feel really powerless or around you know some of these major questions and barriers and so on but you know i can tell you and i mean you know Arif, you've been here um that some of the most fundamental shifts that have happened on this campus has been through community members demanding um accountability uh and so um i think it's really important for people to know how empowered they actually are and that you know our office and our positions are here to kind of leverage and and amplify but it it really is um you know a bit of a hazard and i remember when i started uh at the human rights office many many years ago at queens going to a meeting and there was somebody here uh, who had been a longtime activist in the community. Uh, and we were talking about human rights on campus and their reaction to me was really hostile. I was just a, like I was a new advisor in the office and they were just like you, um, you know, you've taken on uh, this role and this is exactly we the activists knew that this was going to happen as soon as you took on this role people were going to feel like um, we embodied the issue and that the institution had taken care of it by hiring um, a person i think that that is a real danger that people can lose sight of it and think that well you know we've ticked the box we've hired this person and therefore um, you know, these issues are, are, have, have been addressed. Um, well, we, we all know that that's very, very far from the truth. And actually we need to continue to work in relationship with people to actually mobilize things. There's just no way, um, that one person or a handful of people can institute the kind of change that we're talking about. We need community. 
Absolutely. It, it's so fundamental. And in, in my experience, uh, Stephanie, um, the office that I over, uh, oversee um, is only here because of community. And the institution was responsive to community at that time. And community making their voices heard is, is critical to these offices continuing to be viable um, in, in different ways, I think. And it, it gives you um, uh, that additional credibility, like you said, if you're not connected to community, then something is definitely wrong because that's, I believe that is where we draw our uh, authority from having that connection. Ari, uh, Valerie, what about your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I can uh, pipe in here. I think, Stephanie, you really said it very well. Um, uh, you know, I've often felt doing this work and, and someone else also mentioned, you know, we do this work and we continue to do the work and we're really committed because we believe in it and we, we, we think and we've seen in our time in institutions change. Sometimes that change looks incremental. Sometimes, you know, we have moments of, of what feels like transformation, even though there's there's so much more to do. I don't think we'd be we'd be here if we if we felt like you know, we were getting in the way of, of making making change or, or we didn't have any hope at all. But it, it absolutely is. And especially when we're here for long periods of time, you, you see these kinds of patterns and, and that pattern of, you know, folks who, you know, for good reason, mistrust um, institutional commitments. Uh, and so when we step into the first of all, I mean, you start off from the space of we need more minoritized people in senior leadership. And then we have people like ourselves step into these, you know, uh, middle management and then senior roles. And then all of a sudden, we're not sure if we can, folks can trust us. And, and I think that's a, that's a healthy skepticism. And, and, you know, we should always be self-reflective. And it's like the, 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 the portrait of Dorian Gray. Can we sleep at night? At, to what extent are we now positioning ourselves in terms of proximity to power, uh, you know, complicity. And I think we, we all always do that. Um, and so I, I think what, what is important is for um, social justice communities, absolutely to have conversations with us and challenge us, um, but also work with us, listen uh, to us, be in dialogue with us, uh, uh, collaborate and cooperate and, and um, uh, let's brainstorm together. Um, I had a really wonderful conversation early on in my um, uh, term with, with uh, here at McMaster with um, Senator Dr. Wanda Thomas Bernard. And she said, we all exercise our activism in different ways. And it is so important to know the value that, that, that students from their location can agitate, scholars with tenure, how they can agitate, staff from their position, they're a little bit more precarious, so we don't often hear from staff, um, folks in administration. And, and, and so we all have various places and, 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 and stakes, uh, but we're committed and everything we do in totality helps move um, things forward. And, and to, um, I, I think that that's the, I'm, a, I'm constantly thinking about the ways that I can continually be um, in relationship with a multitude of different stakeholders, right? I love this culture bridging is a big piece of the work that, that we're doing. Yes, thank you, Stephanie and Erika. I absolutely agree with you. I rely a lot on the partners in the community to, to advance EDI. And there is an Office of the Indigenous, Vice President Indigenous, that I have close relationships with. 
In Manitoba, we have a huge Indigenous population and it is a strategic priority at the University of Manitoba to create pathways to Indigenous engagement and excellence. So I work very closely with that group to advance their agenda. But I also work very closely with the LGBTQ community and persons with disabilities and racialized persons and support all of the employee resource groups. Without community, I, I'm not sure how far. I think the community influences senior management decisions, senior leaders' decision, and we need senior leader commitment without a doubt. And it's been since the murder of George Floyd that my institution has really taken um, a turn on their commitment to EDI. So I'm really grateful for that. Recently, we've developed an EDI community of practice and for the University of Manitoba, which is a relatively small campus, 30,000 faculty, staff and students, there are 200 members in the community of practice. And that is really gives me a lot of hope that there's people who, and though a lot of the advocates work on the side of their desks and they are not getting paid or recognized for their work, they assist me in creating the initiatives that we need to move this forward. Can I just say that I have been amazed. We talked about distributed leadership. There are some people, so now I'm, I'm seeing some folks, you know, there, there's an increased um, uh, amount of commitment and investment to either, you know, hiring a dedicated person that's localized, um, whether it's a full-time job or stipended or an honorarium, but there are still quite a lot of people doing this work on a volunteer basis. And the number of faculty and students that have come forward to me and said, I want to be a, a part of this and that support my work is, is just uh, amazing. That's Thank goodness for them. Hear. Yeah. And, and Valerie, you're mentioning the uh, employee resource groups or uh, in, in uh, our organization, uh, they're called community networks. They're so very vital Absolutely. to bring into um, various consultation processes when policies are being developed, when strategies are being determined and the idea of of community as you mentioned Arik, uh working in concert together because it's it's about um how all of that brought together brings about change not each individual or each different party just going along their their own path and road although that's fine um, but to change these organizations, it's like turning around an ocean liner. It, it takes a lot of effort just mm -hmm. to move it. Uh oh, I, are, is this what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm saying effort. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort, money, and resources just mm -hmm. to turn it around ever so slightly. And and as you mentioned, Valerie. The murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. awakened so many people to what all of us have been telling our colleagues mm -hmm. for so many years about racism existing. And that mm -hmm. is very much ingrained and in a part of our organizations and it takes direct intention to change it and exterminate it to get rid of it that's it's it's very critical it doesn't happen just by wishing it away and and just being nice stephanie i saw that you wanted to jump in i actually wanted to jump in on the um, issue of george floyd and just ask other folks you know I'm trying to still figure it out exactly from the perspective that you just gave Denise because and I saw other people nodding it's like when that tragedy happened every one of us who's you know part of these communities said 
here we go again. As traumatizing as that was, it, it was another incident. But something happened. Something happened around that um, particular incident that I'm still trying to figure out and 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 trust actually as um, an an EDI ECI leader in my institution. Um, trying to trust that those intentions are real, that that commitment is real. You know, those volunteers who are jumping in and wanting to do uh something is is real but i i felt it too and and i've been surprised you know that that flurry of energy um that happened around august uh in our institution um has continued and i didn't expect it to have any longevity i'm just wondering if there are any other reflections on that, or we can just leave the point and, and move on. But that, yeah, just something that I've noticed and that, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly working with in my role. Well, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, it's so, uh, so important for us to pause and think about this, because I think um, it's indicative uh, to, to me of, well, uh, of a number of things, two things that I can think of is, is um, that's, social expectations are changing right and then number two there was something about the incident and how and 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 the way that it was so transparently um presented for everyone to see that it was undeniable you know in a lot of our work the literature you know it shows that where there are ambiguous situations the implicit bias creeps in and then there's a rationalizing way I think it was just so one of the elements is so 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 stark um and and undeniable and tapped into a, a, a kind of humanity and empathy coupled with i think shifts socially it's kind of like the climate movement right a lot of uh, folks the younger generation right getting out there and 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 saying no this isn't this isn't going to work and then it going global um yeah there are too many witnesses now and i think you know i i think it really did shift in my as i'm speaking to people in my institution their their hearts and 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 therefore then their minds this is a form of heart work mm -hmm. heart That's surgery it maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> valerie did you want to add more to that i just hope that we can maintain that momentum it was a tragic event the public lynching of george floyd and there's been many others um and usually you know things happen the news cycle changes and it's forgotten so i think we have to unfortunately capitalize on this moment and make the most of it Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, and and back to your point, Stephanie, the fact that it is continuing. Uh, we, we thought it would be a flash in the pan, but it, it seems as though it's having some lasting power. Um, could you explain why that has surprised you? I mean, it, it certainly has surprised me and I'm thinking before this window closes, let's get as much time as we can for our communities. But if, if you could elaborate more on that, would appreciate it. Well, you know, I mean, I, I can just give one example of how this is working within our particular institution. So uh, when that uh, tragedy happened, um, there was uh, essentially like a, a meeting of senior leadership to decide, you know, how people would respond to this and um, what the principal uh, came up with and directed was that we were going to um, create a pledge. We were going to uh, create a senior leadership declaration of commitment to eliminate systemic racism. 
I'm not going to lie. Like now I've, I'm saying it publicly. This is available now for playback. When I was part of that conversation um, around that, I thought, okay, let's make a, make a pledge. That will be a good thing to do. Um, you know, it's the least that we can do. Um, but, you know, it was to me, you know, sort of part of like a long line of statements of commitment that we have made. So I didn't really know what the import of that declaration would be. And I've been completely surprised by it. I think that, you know, to a, a, a Reek's point and, and Valerie's point and, and yours too, Denise, it was just the right moment. Like it was just, you know, sort of all of these um, factors coming together um, to create an environment in which people were actually like hungry for this kind of a message because we put it out there and you know it really resonated with people and not only has it resonated with folks but you know in in ways that i did not imagine people are actually mobilizing those words i was just speaking with a faculty member the other day where they were talking to new faculty about how to create an inclusive classroom and they held up the declaration and said this is why we do it because our institution is committed to it i'm like my goodness right so um it really has i i mean you know it's it's so um ironic and and sad that this is how this has happened and you know this isn't new either that you know some of the biggest changes you know politically socially um, in our world have happened on the back of tragedy. Um, but it really has had um, like lasting power, as you were saying, Denise. And people are holding us accountable to those words. This pledge that every senior leader on our campus signed and the senior leaders themselves are holding themselves accountable to those words. So it's 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 just been really interesting to see how this has been mobilized in different places. I'll also mention as well, it's interesting because I think what you're speaking to, Stephanie, is um, many of us have, have, you know, will hear about pledges and commitments and a lot has been written about, you know, intentions, not not moving to actions. And, you know, a lot of debate around whether some of these commitments are just symbolic. I, I do think the symbolism is, is so important, but although it's not enough. But I think the, the, the statements uh, and commitments, you know, were coupled with action in, in, in part potentially because when I think about the landscape, this higher sector, higher education sector landscape was in the context of Okay, Universities Canada has put out principles, EDI principles, Indigenous Indigenous um, uh, uh, education principles. Um, the uh, Tri-Agency Council, EDI requirements tied to funding, um, uh, and and so the the sector is kind of socialized to EDI broadly. And then, what I saw after George Floyd is at least on our campus, the the community of of black scholars and students use their use their voice and then we had industry business community saying like black north are you going to sign on to this um pledge um government of canada now you know is talking about a 50 30 uh pledge a number of professional associations uh pledging so yeah i think that the 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 symbolic move to a bit of a a movement. A, 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 I don't know if it's premature to say it's beginning to feel like a mainstreaming. A good point that you made too, that one possible difference in all of this is that there's like an accountability structure that's built into it. We're no longer just saying we're pledging. Mm -hmm. We're making commitments, yes. agreeing publicly with Black North or whoever it is to hold or try counsel to hold ourselves accountable to that which we have committed. Um, so that is, I think, new. 
And I would add the, the, the situation uh, around George Floyd, the reaction to the murder of George Floyd brought about such a swelling groundswell of solidarity from across mm -hmm. so many different groups that maybe in the past had not come together in the same way. And again, with uh, um, unfortunately the locating of the 250 little ones in Can Loops and the groundswell and reaction to that. And again, the solidarity and the solidarity around the anti Asian racism that has been happening across North America, it, it just speaks to how our communities absolutely need to come together to bring about these vital changes, not only in higher ed, but within society. And, and given all that has happened, I would dare say that many more people are looking at these areas for places to advance their careers, to uh, do EDI work and to involve themselves as I think maybe it was Stephanie, maybe it was all of you that mentioned that various members of your own respective communities, campus communities have reached out to you because they want to be a part of that change. So just, just to take it in a slightly different direction, given all of that, for individuals who come to you for advice on uh, starting a career in, in, in this area and, and what, what is needed to mm -hmm. be an EDI professional and, and who, who, not necessarily who, but what do you look for um, when, when you're looking to invite someone to work with you or even to the point of hiring someone to be within uh, your respective divisions. Um, Valerie, since you're the HR person. I <laughs> Thanks, Denise. You know, this is interesting because I was approached by a white colleague and she said I'm interested in equity, diversity, and inclusion. I was looking at, you know, applying or advancing my skills. So I suggested to her that she does take some some courses and, and uh, you know, get knowledgeable and build culture, cultural awareness. And I did have some hesitation, I have to be honest, because she is a white woman. And so I have a, a conflict. Do I believe that a white woman can perform uh, be responsible for equity, diversity, inclusion, as well as a black or a racialized or an indigenous person. And I'm not sure about that. So I look for someone. I, I'm surrounded. I'm very, very fortunate. I surround myself with my colleagues who I consider woke. I, you know, of course I am responsible to deliver, you know, EDI to the community, but I don't have to hang out with people who I don't believe or are aware or self-aware and is sincerely an accomplice. I'm looking for accomplices. I'm not looking for allies, performative allies. So, I, you know, maybe you guys can inform me because I, I'm questioning, can a white person promote EDI as well as a racialized person, indigenous person? I'm not sure. Uh oh, you put the challenge out there. Yeah, I did. Arik, Stephanie? Well, I mean, I will say that um, certainly someone who has lived experience of um, inequity and and uh, and inequities with respect to those things that are quite salient, right? Where you walk around the world every day uh, and you are coded as. Um, uh, one of the uh, minoritized groups, right? I, I self-identify as a racialized woman, but I'm coded as a racialized woman. Um, but even then, I could I could step into a space and, and not do a, a great 
deal of good work in the EDI space if I have not committed to uh, consciousness raising for myself, if I've not committed to my understanding my own um, trauma and and reconciling that in terms of, of, of how it plays into the work that I do, if I don't think about my uh, privilege in terms of the learning I have to do uh, as, a, as an immigrant settler, in terms of not, not being indigenous and uh, someone who has not had lived experience of, of uh, living with a disability. So, um, you know, so, so in terms of, uh, I would say, so white women as an example, we are really clear on, on the gender inequities that, that have existed and continue to, to exist. Um, and, and, and I think for sure white women have been really strong um, advocates and, and allies, uh, but certainly there is a, a big space of gap potentially in terms of really understanding and appreciating um, racial in, inequities and, and quite frankly, at building rapport with, with communities will be a challenge as well. Um, and then if you're thinking about, I, I know um, some, some excellent allies uh, who are um, w white men or in the space of working with respect to disability and LGBTQ. Um, but again, the, the, the saliency and the profound, the profound bias and systemic inequities baked into gender and racial inequities um, and I would say sort of visible disability. So where there's a, a, a visibility of, of these inequities, um, we see such, such prof profound barriers. And, and it's really important for uh, folks, if they're coming in without that lived experience, there's a heck of a lot. The bar is really high in terms of consciousness and, and proficiency. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Stephanie? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I do know wonderful people who have done um, very, very good work um, in the space and, um, you know, have the critical consciousness that is necessary and the grit, quite frankly, to to push things along. And, and I admire that. But I agree with you that it's, um, you know, I, I need them to tell me, you know, how they do this work and how they, you know, negotiate and navigate spaces um, in a way that is actually going to substantially move conversations forward. And the people that, you know, I have good relationships with, um, like around this, the white men and women um, who do, they get that, right? So I don't feel worried about offending you know, people in saying that, and they will again have the kind of um, yeah. you know reflective consciousness necessary to 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 deal with that. That's yeah. kind of the first sign. Go ahead, Rick. I just want to say, I mean, and the reality is, this is why you should never have one of. If you have a team, then then you want to, to bring all of us together to 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 move things forward and. and uh, I remember a really great one of the first institutes I went to was put on by the Canadian Race Relation Foundation, and and they had a, four people facilitating so that they could they could really have diverse perspectives come forward. Yeah, that is a, that is an excellent point. That is an excellent point. Um, and yeah, I'll just you know say otherwise. Like, what do we recommend um, for people? Yeah, as as all of you were saying. Um, you know, like something rooted in critical theory, like you've got to have that. So, you know, whether that's critical legal studies or whether it's CRT or, you know, whatever, um, you know, for me, that's, that's like a major starting point. I don't know how you just kind of like pick that up out of the air without dedicating, you know, some study to that. So, um, so I'm looking for that, um, and it could, as I said, be in like a variety of disciplines. Um, but a couple of things that I found that are really important, um, you know, I think that really key to the work that we do as, as inclusion leaders is communicating and educating. 
So even as we're doing policy work and even as we're doing data collection and analysis and you know all of those sorts of things, um, I think in lots of ways we're fundamentally educators. And if you're not able to communicate and convey ideas and to speak to hearts as well as minds and to shift a conversation, then I think you're going to have a really, really hard time in that in this space because we're not um, we're not actually given a lot. You know, there's a lot that kind of restricts us. We have um, we're in this liminal environment, right, where we are kind of administrators, but kind of not administrators, where we kind of have influence, but we also have no authority. So you've got to be able to really move with that and connect with people. So I'm so I find more and more that I'm I'm looking for educators. All, always good people have um, you know uh, a lot of the other things like including possibly a legal analysis but i'm i'm looking for educators and communicators who have that critical consciousness that's that's great it it, it is clear to me that there's not a, a cookie cutter profile for an edi professional certainly lived experience is is a very important piece to this because that's what you pull from in in many ways to keep you going to be courageous to speak truth to power at times and being a good communicator educator and being educated having a level of expertise in some area related to EDI whether that be accessibility whether that be connected to queer community, whether that be uh, a legal analysis with respect to human rights, but it's it's not an assumption. I would assume everyone would agree that if you are from one of those, as is called equity seeking or equity deserving groups, the terminology keeps changing, so I'm not sure which one to land on, but. Uh, just having the lived experience isn't enough. And just because you're from one of those groups, it is not the assumption that you have the expertise or capability to operate within such a complex organization as universities. So it does uh, require bringing forward particular skills, but there's not a cookie cutter profile. And and given that, um, I think it was mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the data and and being able to use that um, uh, with respect to, you know, determining what needs to happen on a particular campus. We we actually got a question from the audience that I'd like to share with you all related to our our. Uh, various equity surveys and so forth um, and wanting to know within our experiences have these workplace surveys so I guess those could be pulse surveys or or experience surveys engagement surveys or or equity surveys have they forced some level of institutional accountability um, Who would like I would to, uh, go, go ahead, Val. I would say so. We need the qualitative data just as much as we need the quantitative data. And this last year, the president uh, formed a task force on EDI, and one of their first jobs was to survey the entire community. And this certainly informed the recommendations for that report. And that is what is leading to an EDI lead over the university, an academic role. So I would say they're useful. I'm not sure how what the percentage the survey response rate was. People are often reluctant. But in this case, this survey proved useful that we're getting some action based on the, the results. So I was happy to see that. Stephanie or Arik? I would say that, um, again, there, 
necessary but insufficient because I, I've been in institutions for a long time where they were running a lot of surveys. And in some points, I didn't know they had these surveys. So it's who, who how, how transparent are these, are these um, data collection um, instruments? Um, who's, who's looking at them and where is the mandate to actually interpret and, and the, the, the quality assurance and quality improvement mandate that will allow you to leverage that, that data, right? Um, and, and so that's the accountability mechanisms, including the governance structures uh, that enable people to transparently look at results and, and then interpret and report back. Yeah, and I agree, like a survey, if it's going to have any usefulness, needs to have a plan behind it. Otherwise, you're just, as you were saying, you're just, you're just surveying, right? We're just collecting the information and collecting the information. Um, but what is it that you're actually planning to do with the information? And it's not enough to say, well, we'll survey and we'll do something with the information. You need an actual institutional plan behind it. And to go back to one of our key themes this afternoon, you need resources to be able to mobilize um, you know, what, what you learn from those surveys. And that doesn't need to necessarily be new resources. But if we're expecting Valerie to do something with those survey results, then that needs to be carved out of you know, all of the things that, you know, um, that, that one is already doing, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the flag that goes up for me when people say we want to do a workplace survey. I'm like, okay, yeah. for what, like, what are now what, like one of the, again, another keyword in this session, performative things that, um, I'm asking lots of questions about at our institution is the, you know, everlasting um, data collection project <laughs> that's happening here. So it goes back, I think somebody in one of the sessions yesterday was talking about analysis paralysis. And so the first thing on everybody's list, which is not necessarily a bad thing if it doesn't end there, but everybody wants to do a survey, everybody, even when the information is available, um, then they'll want to get the information, you know, for themselves. Well, that was for the university, but now we want it for our department. Well, that was for the department, but now we want it for our particular unit. So they just, keep wanting to um you know study and and restudy again i'm not saying that that's inherently bad but i think that to be more effective um it helps for there to be sort of a centralized institutional plan around just where we're headed with the various forms of data collection that we're doing and how these pieces can work together to present a picture that we can all work from. That's right. That's right. And it, it, you you just took me back, Stephanie, to when I started uh, in my initial role at Ryerson, and uh, my first assignment was to develop uh, a program for collecting and communicating our equity data for employee uh, equity data. And when I was shown what was being done and I looked at it, I said, well, no wonder people don't want to respond or be a part of it. You're not telling them why you're collecting the information. You're not telling them what you're going to use it for. Is it going to be shared publicly? How will it inform decision making? And the journey that um, we've gone on thus thus far is is really uh, trying to make sure we're as transparent as possible with the information that we have, and to the point of accountability, 
sharing it directly with decision makers uh, so that it informs their hiring, it informs how they retain, it informs how they lead and create an inclusive climate within their respective areas. But, you know, of course, um, you know, that can only take you so far because when certain situations happen, it's, it's not the data that informs, it's those voices that comes from the community. And which brings me to uh, another question that we got from uh, our audience here. Um, how do you feel about the tendency for universities to direct their attention at the symptoms of the problem? That's how it's being framed here. Symptoms such as anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim racism, discrimination, harassment as a whole. You, you see where this is going. Rather than the root problem, which is white supremacy. And given that um, uh, we were able to bring the White Privilege Conference to Canada in 2018, this question definitely struck a chord with me because Again, with how I started out, racism doesn't exist in Canada. And if racism doesn't exist, white supremacy certainly does not exist. But it's two sides, from my estimation, it's two sides of the same coin. You can't have anti-Black racism unless there's the proliferation of white supremacy, white privilege, and white fragility. What, what are you all's thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the issue of framing is so important. Um, yeah, two sides of the same coin. However, it can can lead to different kinds of aha moments, right? Um, you know, I recently came across language that was a reminder of this, where we talk a lot about education gap as opposed to opportunity gap, right? It almost situates the the problem, the gap is the deficit thinking, right? It can, it, it, it's not explicit, but it has that that tendency to allow for people to 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 situate the problem back with the targets of the, the inequity. Um, and so, yeah, I think a, a reframing, and that's part of our our um, roles and jobs, is to have that make that help people have make that cognitive shift so that they're not thinking about the inequity is as a consequence of something out there. Like I, I deplore it, but it's those individuals and, and that institution as opposed to it's partly what I'm doing and what I'm contributing to in my own institution, all of us included. We have another question. I do want to give you a chance to answer this, but if you could make it short so I can get in this other question because our time is getting short. Yeah, we need to start identifying and uh, dismantling the systems of oppression and racism. I don't think, uh, this, you know, reacting to the symptoms is going to, to uh, get us to where we want to be. I believe it's a systemic racism and the systemic oppression and systemic discrimination that we have to dismantle. Uh, nothing much more to add except that we're, we are trying to have those conversations and they're not easy conversations to have. We've started um, with our leadership team um, and, you know, having um, discussions about, you know, the, the, the origins of this institution, the origins of the university as a colonizing project, you know, about um, how whiteness has informed, you know, how we think about who belongs in this space. And, um, you know, all, uh, again, all I can say is that we're, we're, we're working on it um, and get a lot of pushback. <laughs> uh, 
um, there, you know, people don't appreciate it, but I agree that it's necessary that that's where the conversation starts. And in starting those conversations, it's still important to name things. So even if we are saying that white supremacy is the root of many of these various isms, naming anti-black racism is very different than saying anti-racism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Naming mm -hmm. any of this anti-indigenous or Islamophobia, they, they come with certain trappings. So this has been a fantastic conversation. I wish we had more time. We have about four minutes left, if that. So the last question, I want to focus it back to you all. What do you do to take care of yourself? Self-care, that question always comes up, is very important. How do you maintain self-care? So if, if each of you, just, just one quick minute of what you do for self-care. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it really quickly. But I also, that, there was somebody that asked the question earlier. I saw that they were, or they were asked about in employment. Uh, I think we missed this. Uh, Canadian experience. All I want to say is, I think there's some some restrictions on being able to ask for Canadian experience, and we should be focusing on bona fide requirements of the job. So just so that you don't think you're missing anything, and consult with someone in your organization uh, to get support around that. So the things that I do for self care, uh, two, two words: uh, networks and Netflix. <laughs> Ah, I forgot about Netflix, but it's on my that. list. <laughs> Especially with the program, The Chair, these days. That yeah. Yes. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Oh, I am very fortunate to be surrounded by supportive family and friends. And, and you know, it's in one of the weekend. I still talk about EDI. So I have, you know, some of my colleagues are my, my close friends. So I'm just really fortunate. And I try to walk every day, not so successfully, but I try. Yeah, it's, it's, it is really important, I think, for all of us to feel like we can put the burden down mm -hmm. once in a while. And I you know, try to do all of those things too with family and, and walks and that sort of thing. But I also tell people who come to me um, who are activists in the community and they're burning out um, to say it's okay to put the burden down for a day or a week or even to decide to, you know, your earlier point of read that there's a different way in which you want to mm -hmm. engage. But when you get to the mm -hmm. point where it's hurting you, then you mm -hmm. need to take a moment yeah. and, and take a breath um, because the work is always going to be here. Yeah. And I'll just add for myself, uh, Erica Badu, Jill Scott, <laughs> music, music, mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. and uh, listening to audiobooks that just take me away from here and to another really good, happy place. Inspiration. Yes, Inspiration. absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that concludes our session for today. I hope everyone who um, participated here and was listening in uh, that you got something from it. Sorry we weren't able to answer everyone's questions, but there is a follow-up network opportunity. Take advantage of that. Please follow up and look at the bios of our wonderful panelists. You know where, where they are. Reach out to them. There's such a great resource. And again, I just want to thank everyone and thank the forum for having us here today. May everyone have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, everyone.